So to continue with our academic vocabulary teaching and the guidelines for effective instruction, we're now on to point two, be selective about which words you teach. Not all words are going to require instruction. There just isn't enough time. So how do you select which words to teach? Blackowitz and Fisher suggest that knowing what, how, and when to teach vocabulary to English language learners is one of the most difficult tasks facing the teacher. Beck, McEwen, and Kukin, who wrote Bringing Words to Life, suggest that we think of words in tiers, tier one, tier two, and tier three words. Tier one words are those high frequency words which students are likely to already know. So we don't need to spend a lot of time on those words. With your ELLs, however, you need to check to see if they do know those words. Tier two words are the academic vocabulary found in texts across the content areas. So those are those high impact words that we want to spend time on. They're also words that would be beneficial for your students to know at their age and proficiency level. So something like the word responsible. And tier three words are low frequency, specialized vocabulary of the content areas. They also need to be taught, but within your content area. So here's examples of tier three words from the content areas, very specific to those subject areas and examples of tier two words. And you can see how those words cross content areas. So if we spend time on those words, they're going to be transferable. And then also words that you think children would benefit from knowing. So how do you determine what would be a tier two word? There are three considerations. The importance and utility. Is this a word the student at this age, at their proficiency level, would benefit from knowing? Instructional potential. Will they see this word in other texts? And conceptual understanding. Do they have the words already to use to define this word? So something like responsible, they understand taking care of and having an important duty. So where do we get the words? The words can come from word lists, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The texts the students are reading or from the students themselves. They might ask, what does this word mean? Or, or show some kind of indication they'd like to learn this word. Now I know you don't have the story of ice cream in front of you, but you can imagine what that would be like, what that text would be like. Here's an example of what a teacher determined would be tier one, tier two, and tier three words from this text. So the tier one words she thought the students would likely know. She might double check with her ELLs ahead of time. The tier two words are those words that she's going to spend time and effort on teaching. And in this case, for a, for a literature text, we're going to explain tier three words briefly for comprehension and then move on. So this is a passage, The Gift of the Nile, that I had to uh, teach to some grade six English language learners in a pullout situation. They were at about a level three of proficiency. And I just want to show you the process I went through when I was going to teach this text or read this text with them and teach them some vocabulary. So this is the text. I don't think I need to read it out loud. You can read it to yourselves. Probably for the per first part, we would look at a map so that they had an idea of where the Nile was. So the first thing I did was I highlighted all the words that I thought might need teaching. And I wasn't sure. I wasn't the classroom teacher. So I underlined, I highlighted all of the words. There were quite a few. Then I made a list of those words. And I decided if they would be a tier two word, am I going to spend time on that word? Would they benefit from knowing it? Or is it a tier three word? I'm going to explain it briefly and move on. So you can see from this list that there are very, quite a few tier two words. In fact, these are the tier two words. And I didn't have enough time to teach all of those words. And for teachers as well, be selective about what you teach. Che teach two to three words. You just have to leave the rest for now and spend that time on two to, th two to three. So I, I decided on the words create, flows, and main. And then I had to think of student-friendly definitions. So I'm just going to show you what I did 
with create. So in context, the uh, create from the passage was uh, the create, this created fertile farmland in an area that would otherwise have been parched desert. So I would explain fertile and quickly and move on. So that farmland produced a lot of crops. Create means to make something or to cause something to happen. For example, I created a painting for my son for a Christmas present. When I was a little girl, my brother used to create trouble at the dinner table by kicking me under the table. When have you created something? I created something when, and this, the two boys came up with sentences to, to share, to generate sentences about their understanding of create. So this could be uh, the process that a teacher goes through when you're looking at a passage and deciding which, which words you're going to teach. So teachers do ask, how do I know which words to teach in grade four? or in grade six? Is there a list of words for, grade, for those grades? There are suggested lists of academic words and it's in your study guide. However, these are just suggestions and it's really your professional judgment as to which words you're going to teach. There's no right or wrong answer. The important part is to do teach words. Even though there's lots of words that students need to learn, we do need to teach some of them. Try, te try it with a text that you're going to be working with in your, with your students soon. Try to choose some words that you think would be tier two, tier three, perhaps tier one, and try to come up with a student-friendly definition that you would use with your students. So now that we've talked about how to teach individual words and how to select which words to teach, I'm going to talk about the rest of the guidelines to, to wrap up this video. So we want to provide multiple exposures to the targeted word. Students need to see or encounter the word seven to 10 times for retention. Structure opportunities where students hear the word, see it in context, hear it again in context, and use the word, use and write the word. Students will not develop a strong expressive vocabulary by just listening to it being discussed or used by the teacher. So try to work in those times where you can uh, talk about the word. Play vocabulary games, um, have them record, as I said earlier, in their personal dictionary. Uh, make a web map of synonyms and antonyms. Break the word down into parts and come up with other words that have that root word. So responsible could be response and other words that are related to responsible. The Freyer model is where students write down the word in the middle and then write down a definition and an example and a non-example. And this is particularly beneficial for students in groups to come up with, especially the non-example of that word, irresponsible, for example. Instead of having a word wall, have a vocabulary wall. So words that they're using or learning are posted on the wall for them to refer to have word sorts, word associations, and talk about the relationships among words. There are lots of ideas online if you look up vocabulary games. Provide opportunities to extend word knowledge simply means to teach students word learning skills, so teach them how to break the words down into meaningful parts. Morphology is the study of the parts of words and is a powerful strategy for ELLs because it gives them a key for unlocking that academic vocabulary, especially in the higher grades. Teach words with multiple meanings, uh, polysemous words, and teach children how to figure out the word from context, although that is a difficult task for ELLs because they might not know the meaning of the words around the target word. Foster word consciousness. This is inspiring that interest in words and appreciation of words. You can do this by talking about words and their nuances of meaning, have students be word detectives and listen for those words outside of school and come back and share when they've heard that. And it's generally getting students excited about words. And lastly, encourage wide reading. Books are where the words are. That's our academic language. Nonfiction provides more uh, rich vocabulary than literature, but both of them are really good sources of that academic vocabulary. 
And this also includes reading aloud to your students. They really don't get too old for the teacher to, be, to read aloud to them. And not only do they hear rich language, they hear it modeled fluently and with expression. And I liked this quote, you can't build a vocabulary without reading. You can't meet friends if you stay at home by yourself all, all of the time. In the same way, you can't build up a vocabulary if you never meet any new words. And to meet them, you must read. The more you read, the better. So in summary, an effective vocabulary program in uh, teaching a word involves the definition and the context of the word, discussion of the word's meaning, active and deep processing of those words, multiple exposures, review, rehearse, and remind students about those words, and lots of time is spent on those words. It does take more time to teach academic vocabulary, but the payoff is huge. So active student engagement and deep processing of words is critical to vocabulary acquisition. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that uh, watching the seven videos has helped you with your planning and instruction of your English language learners. If you need more information, there are references on the study guide, or you can browse the website. Thank you.